Hello, everyone. I am Anita Sarkeesian. I'm the executive director of Feminist Frequency, and I am so excited to be here with y'all today. Um, we are going to be talking about HBO Max's Minx, which is a brand new TV show set in 1970s Los Angeles about an earnest young feminist who joins forces with a low rent publisher to create the first erotic magazine for women. Uh, it's funny, it's smart, it looks amazing, and I'm so honored to be able to be with the people who made this thing happen. So let me welcome this entire amazing uh, panel of folks that we have. First, we have creator and showrunner Ellen Rappaport. We have director Rachel Lee Goldenberg, music supervisor Brianne Rose, costume designer Beth Morgan, and lead actors from the show Idara Victor, who plays Tina, and Ophelia Lovey Bond, who plays Joyce. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for waking up and being with us today. <laughs> Let's start from the beginning. So, Ellen, <laughs> this is a comedy about feminism and pornography. It is both kind of scintillating and fascinating topic. And like, how did this come to be? Like, where, why, why does this exist? <laughs> um, you know, I read an article about one of these real publications in the 70s, and it, it just immediately struck me as this very fertile territory for a workplace comedy because the real magazines of this era, Playgirl, Viva, um, they actually were run by a combination of feminists and pornographers. Um, so, I mean, I kind of feel like if you read that and you don't think it's a TV idea, like you probably shouldn't be a TV writer. It feels like very, it felt very clear, very obvious to me. Um, and I started researching uh, both the magazines themselves and that era. And it just felt like I was really struck by how many similarities there were to that period in the early seventies and the time that we were living through. Um, and it felt like a very good way to talk about things that were modern, but kind of through this prism um, of a period 50 years ago. Yeah, I actually was gonna ask that because I'm curious, I, I feel like a lot of period media has something to teach us today, right? Like there's a through thread. It's not just like, oh, look at those people who did these wild things back in the day. Like, what is it that you feel like this story relates to to us today? I mean, I think it relates on so many levels. It's the issues are largely the same that they were talking about then as we are now. Um, I think, you know, to me, it's kind of this classic story of you know, somebody who has, is like smart and passionate, but has some entitlement coming into this place that, you know, is populated by people who are not necessarily as academic, but have more life experience than her and realizing she's misjudged them and they have more to teach her than she realized. So to me, that's like kind of a classic story. Um, and then, you know, just kind of that kind of what it takes to be an artist and merge that with commerce also felt classic. And then of course, all the women's issues of the time are, you know, still, I mean, obviously abortion is something that we're still grappling with today. And I think a lot of people are still talking about this kind of emotional labor that women take on. And that was a very much a hot button topic then. So um, it, it felt, it felt like a like an easy way in, I guess, for a modern audience who might not have been familiar. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I'm curious, while while we open up to the the rest of the panel here, like, how did you put the creative team together for this show? Like, I believe this is your first. You've been in Hollywood for a long time, but this is your first time a show running. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. um, so, like, what it, can you talk a little bit about the process of putting this team together and what that was like? Yeah, um, I mean, it, it was mostly put together during the pandemic. Um, for the actors, the majority of them came in and read. And, uh, you know, they I think almost all of them read before the world shut down. So they had the benefit of reading with our great casting directors. Um, and for, you know, for, for some people, it was just very, very obvious that like those were the people. Um, unfortunately, we weren't able to hire them for seven months. So they sit around and wait, but I knew that we were hiring them. In agony, had to wait in agony. Yeah, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I told your team that it was looking I good. I know the pandemic wasn't your fault, it's fine. Sorry, I apologize. Um, and let's see, Rachel, you know, was somebody that we were interested in because of her work. Um, and when she came in, she just really seemed like she was on the same page as us. 
um, mostly tonally, I think was kind of what we were looking for is, you know, it's, it's like a tricky tone because, you know, we're trying to convince people to root for a, a feminist to go into pornography. Um, and she just really, she, it just felt like she had always been there, <laughs> you know, like she just felt like she was, it was exactly on the same page as us. So, um, I should, that, that's, I mean, that is a, a testament to the script because it was really, you know, we, I mean, we all read a lot of scripts and, and it, it really, the tone just jumped off the page in a really specific way where sort of the energy of it and the comedy and the heart and the warmth really just, yeah, it felt very intuitive reading it. Like it immediately made sense to me what I thought that Ellen wanted it to feel like, and then was validating when I pitched and she's like, yes, that is what I wanted. <laughs> that is it. And, you know, Beth and Brianne, um, they came in with these great pitches which like Beth came in with boards and she already had these ideas for what, you know, what she wanted the show to look like costume wise. And, you know, she was somebody that I think I stalked for a little while because like the first time we were making the pilot before the pandemic shut down, she wasn't available. And then finally she was available because of a shutdown. And, um, you know, I was really determined to get her to be honest because I had, I was such a huge fan of the clothes in glow that she had done, which felt like, they were um, period clothing, but it didn't feel like too pushed or like a joke. And it felt like a version of it I had never, you know, I had never seen before. And it seemed like so much thought went into each piece of clothing from a character perspective of what that person was thinking when they picked out that skirt. Um, and I just felt like our show would really benefit from that. Um, and Brienne also came in with this kind of like, she had, she had this idea correct me if I'm wrong, I might be getting this wrong, of, you know, she said in this period, each record label, you know, had one girl, they had this one token girl. <laughs> and so there were all these with female artists who had to, you know, either put out records by themselves or, you know, work with other female artists. But like, because of, they didn't have that institutional support, a lot of times they weren't as successful as they deserve to be. And so there are all these songs that you can afford that should have been <laughs> and sound like him. <laughs> and so how great would it be to take those artists and kind of give them the exposure now that they should have had then. And it just felt like it really tied thematically into, you know, the bottom dollar staff and like- A uh, lot of underdogs. Spider underdog story. Yeah. And that's the pay equity issue that we're all as women still dealing with now, 50 years later, as you talk about the show, dealing with current issues and back then, like that's a perfect example of how we're as women still fighting for that issue. Yeah. Wow. I, <laughs> I wish I could spend hours with you all. Like I have so many, <laughs> I like, I wish I could have been a fly on the wall of this production. Cause it just, it sounds so incredible. And let, let's just like, let's go to music real quick then, since that was the, the, the segue that was just handed to me. Um, okay. I'm going to say something that is totally not true. Uh, music is, well, this is true. Music is my, yeah. like yeah. Uh, <laughs> sound design and music is like my most weak part of my understanding of creative process. So, so to me, in a lot of ways, music feels like a blanket that almost invisibly wraps around production, right? It kind of like locks it together. And I think it's because it's the most, that for me, it's the most mysterious part of it. Um, and I, I, I guess I, like, I'm curious about um, part of what, what Ellen was talking about of like, how do you approach music um, for a time period where some people have lived through it. Many of us have a conception of what 70s music is, but, but like that's not the reality of the time period, right? So how do you match like being, and did it matter about being authentic to the 70s versus the vision that Ellen and Rachel were bringing forward versus um, like the tone of the, the, the show itself? Yeah, it's such a great question because I think they had created such a strong aesthetic with the way that the script was written with, you know, bringing in these great actors and having all of this, all of these pieces together. So I think the aesthetic was really in place by the time I came on board in terms of what it looked like. So we just had a lot of conversations about what it needed to sound like. And I think we did want to focus on having a lot of female artists because we really wanted Joyce's vision to be represented. So we had a lot of, you know, we talked about, again, the underdogs and bringing in artists who were not recognized at the time in the way that maybe they should have been. 
um, artists that struggled, artists that, you know, just weren't, um, you know, they, they just, there's a lot of male artists at the time that were really getting a lot of attention, but um, we wanted to kind of shine a light on, on a lot of the, the women. So we were able to, I think we were able to do that. We brought in so many amazing different artists and we had a ton of music and um, Ellen's vision was really not to have a composer. She didn't want it to feel like there was score leading us emotionally. So I think that that was really fun for us to be able to just say, all right, let's get a ton of great music in there that we can lean into that feels authentic and feels, you know, of course, we, everything was is very era specific. Everything is 1972 or before. Yeah. So, that's and it's such a fun pocket that that pocket of music is just, it's like a dream to, to get to really focus on that. Yeah. And I just, I love that the spirit of how you approached it is, is kind of the spirit of the the message of the, the show too, right? Like that's, uh, that's really lovely. Um, okay, so the underdog thing uh, makes me think also about the show um, and mostly um, Adara to you of like, you know, there is this ragtag group of outcasts, right? Like they're just, you know, and, and of the time, right? So we're talking about like uh, BIPOC folks and queer folks and sex workers and, and like working class folks in this space where they all created this kind of, messy found family of outcasts and I when I think about your character Tina I feel like she is like the kind of unsung hero of this space right like she is running everything managing everyone's feelings running the business managing these huge personalities between Joyce and Doug um and like I, you still so much hold your own in this character you still have so much presence um on the show despite almost like the the idea of the character is almost background. I'm curious how you like navigate the identity of who uh, Tina is and how you approach that character in this space. I think with Tina, I always just thought of it like when she's dealing with all these different kinds of people, she's sort of like ready to take on anything, right? So I don't know how much she even notices how different these people are because she's just like, this is what needs to be handled. So when she takes people in, I think she thinks about what they have to bring to the table for whatever needs to be handled. And she's not really that concerned with where they fit in society. You know, it's more like, how can they be a benefit to what we're trying to do here, you know? And, um, and she knows that they have to be a family. And so, you know, we have to figure things out together. And this one's going to be difficult right now, but she knows how to sort of handle everyone. She's like, I've, I know how to deal with, you know, this photographer over here who always gets like this or, you know, this guy who thinks his magazine is the most important one or, you know, whatever. And, and the sex worker, she's just like, yeah, we're used to this. This is all just normal, fair for her. So um, I had talked about this with Jake before, but I just think porn happens to be what they're selling. You know, um, I don't I don't feel like Tina was coming at it with any sort of like um, a ph philosophical idea of how she should be, you know, moving in the world. I think she was just like, this makes us money. Let's sell this and let's do it well, you know, and as well as we can, as much money as we can make. And so she uses each person for what they have to bring to the table. And, you know, I, I honestly think it's fun for her. I, I think the, the chaos is fun because she always has something to do. You know, <laughs> it's like, there's always someone to wrangle. There's always yeah. something to fix, you know. It's always someone to be mad at. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah. Every day, you know? Yeah. yeah. Nice. Um, okay. So in contrast to that character, Ophelia, you play um, Joyce, who I got to say is so close to being a feminist stereotype, but is it, which I think is kind of the magic of this show. Um, so I love to hear more about how like, um, I know that like the script obviously included a lot more nuance and depth to this character as the, the season progressed, but I'm curious about how you found the right tone and the performance to preserve the comedy elements, but also stay true to her being three-dimensional and not falling into these uh, stereotypical traps. Well, I mean, obviously the foundations of it were it are in the writing, but ultimately she's, I think it's because of her intentions. I think if she was trying to kind of just be right and kind of um, 
arrogantly te telling everyone that she's right, then I think that would make her quite hollow and brittle. But I think it's because she believes that the ideas are right. It's not that she's right. It's that the ideas are an end in themselves and that she's just trying to be the kind of mouthpiece for these ideas that stand alone, independent of her. So it's not that she's right. It's that the ideas are right. And if you'd only listen, you'd see that. And so, and obviously that can come across as incredibly earnest, but I think it's because it's not coming from a place of wanting to be kind of put on a pedestal. It's that she just wants everyone to know about it. So that immediately makes her more likable and relatable because yeah, it's just, there's not an arrogance involved in that. She, I also think the fact that she is quite, um, you know, she can be her own worst enemy. She kind of gets in her own way. I think makes her, you know, it makes her kind of more relatable because she's not perfect. She's not flawless. She's not this kind of pristine version of what she's representing. She's, she's, makes mistakes and and she admits to those mistakes when they happen she doesn't kind of try and breeze past them she she has her mind changed and then she and then she follows through with that um and she and I think it, again it's all in the writing when she'll say something um she, she's not all it's not always clear whether she doesn't understand sarcasm or whether she just simply doesn't find it amusing but again her kind of speaking quite literally about things I I can't but help find that funny I would find that funny if someone would just whenever someone doesn't get something sarcastic that I say I don't find it irritating I was going god how can you not know that I'm joking that's quite in, what where's how's your mind work then and I think it's I think it engenders curiosity about about who she is and where she's coming from but um it was certainly something that I was careful of I was mindful of that I want I don't want people I don't want people to find her kind of inordinately irritating <laughs> But she does need to grate on you a little bit because otherwise it's just, there's no traction. There's nothing to get a foothold in if she's just this glossy, perfect, smoothest exterior. You need to find her. There need to be these kind of sort of ragged edges that you can get your hands into to try and understand her. Um, it was, yeah, it was all in the writing. To Ophelia's credit also, the, you know, that like something that Ellen and I talked about from, from even her first audition tape is that she does like eight things at a time in a way that I haven't <laughs> seen. I, I just, I've never seen this particular thing in an actor before that Ophelia has oh. that I think is one of the things that makes Joyce work and so likable is that she, oh, I, I made her so. Uh, yeah, she's so embarrassed. That she's so <laughs> um, but that. <laughs> It's, it's like really crazy how she'll she can layer like it like like she can be both you know indignant and embarrassed and proud in in one line read and you can give her all like you can just keep adding on to things and she can sort of bring them and add them in a way that's really fun and I think I think you sort of need for Joyce because the 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 bad version of Joyce would be the flat annoying one note version and then the more sort of like layers that you have and the more you feel for her and the more you see you know all the things that Ophelia is talking about that she brings to it is is what makes it um it's what makes it special yeah I would say it's an incredibly hard part um and it's really hard to find the likability in her because she can be entitled and um, judgmental and Ophelia just nails it. I think like you find yourself really rooting for her and liking her despite some super insane things that she says and does. Yeah, I, and I, I feel like her character, I mean, maybe this is like, you know, I'm, I'm a feminist public figure and there is that, like I identify with that indignant, like, but this is the way, <laughs> like, this is the thing, like it's, but, but also you're like, but maybe be smoother about it, right? Or maybe find more accessible ways to do it. I think that there is an appeal to just how complicated that is where you really feel strongly about something, but you just can't quite like get it, uh, communicate it in a way that people can understand outside of your brain. And I, I also feel that comes from, you know, I've certainly been in that situation umpteen times where, yeah, you're exactly, you're passionate about something, you're trying to communicate something and you've simply never been in a situation that has challenged it in the right way that's enhanced your understanding of what you're trying to communicate. So, you know, you, you happen to be set, maybe you're pontificating and you, but you happen to be in a room with different, a different combination of people. And then that combination sparks a different conversation. Mm. And, then, and then it kind of breaks open your understanding of something 
in a in a in a more comprehensive way. And you think that's what I that's how I need to say it. That's it. But I think you see with Joyce, she's in a completely that's happening like tenfold. She's in a completely different environment. She's encountering people from from walks of life that she's simply never experienced before, having gone to Vassar and grown up in Pasadena. So it, she, her idea of feminism is being made a lot more layered, and you see you see her realize she wasn't aware of the gaping holes in her feminism until she, she's like, oh, I really haven't thought about that because I've never spoken to someone who's has that experience. So mm-hmm. you see, I think that's what is endearing about Joyce as the show goes on. You see that learning happening more and more. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Exposure, it feels like for, to me with Joyce, it really is just like, she just hasn't been exposed to these people, you know, like, <laughs> what feels so crazy to her might be perfectly normal to a person like Tina and where Tina grew up, you know? And so it's like, it's just a matter of her getting out more <laughs> in a way. You know? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and you know, there wasn't the internet, like we didn't have yeah. the like mass exposure to different communities and cultures in the same way. Uh, yeah. yeah. Okay. Beth, I uh, would be remiss if we didn't come to you uh, in <laughs> this yeah, we were, I was just thinking about so much about Joyce and Tina as a, as they're talking about it, but go ahead with your question. Yeah. No, I mean, well, great. I'll, I'll cue you and then you can say, you can answer whatever question you want. <laughs> um, but so the costumes are fantastic in this show. Um, you know, the, the scene where the crew walks into the country club is particularly memorable <laughs> for me in terms of really highlighting both using the costuming to highlight the you know, the, the, the differences between these different communities. Um, and you're not new to working on period pieces. You've done quite a few. Um, and I'm just wondering, like, I, I guess I have like a couple, a couple different directions possibly is like, how do you think about, or do you think about contemporary styling versus um, period sure. styling differently? And, and I also, it kind of similar to the question about music is, like, how do you design without falling into cliche? And what does that mean? Because our contemporary memories of a time period might not match what actually was happening in that time period. Oh, right? yeah. okay. We were gabbing before we started about that podcast Rachel was uh, referring to. We dealt with that a lot because actually like with Jake's character, I mean, his but- his button should be done undone to his chest. And I remember the first <laughs> camera test, it was unbuttoned all the way. And Rachel and Alan were like, maybe we just do a couple more buttons. Yeah. And I was like, fair. Cause like, it is what the reality is when you look at our boards and Ellen was so kind with her compliments of me and our meetings, like it, the seventies is a joke in general, when you look at it, like the reality of the seventies is so how do you distill that and be like, we're keeping the authenticness of this period. Cause I am very passionate about the reality of the period but make it where our viewers will distill it about these characters. And as Joyce was going on, Joyce, sorry, Ophelia, was going on about Joyce and like, you know, her finding her, like we really tried to show with the costume, her finding her place, that she doesn't fit in any of these spaces. So we see her throughout the season, all these different spaces. She gets to bottom dollar and she's in her pussy bows and she's, you know, she's taking it very seriously and she's earnest in her, in her look but nobody judges her there. But when she's at the, with the feminists at UCLA and she has a skirt on, it's like, they can't believe that she would show up in this space with a bra on and not high-waisted jeans. So like, you know, she sees this found family like we've been ta- discussing about is the one that keeps her pure. She gets to New York. She doesn't fit in there anymore, even though she's so like, there's all these spaces that she's been in in her life that didn't let her become her truest self. And then she gets with this ragtag misfits as she thinks they are at the beginning, but like, they're the ones that let her be her best version of herself, like like Ophelia was saying. It's like, so allowing yourself, and you know, as Ellen talks about how the the all the different themes in our show have the today's modern implications as much as in the 50 years ago, it's like, yes, if you allow yourself to be around all types of people, all different experiences, like how does that allow you then to, to become your truest best self? And so we really try to do that through the costumes for Joyce and like watch her kind of open up through literally her pussy bow. Like, oh, <laughs> <laughs> like that, you know, you see her really laced up in the beginning. And as she kind of morphs, you know, at the end, she doesn't have her jacket on. She has her, you know, no bow, it's open. So like 
we really I love it. <laughs> had a pussy bow arc for <laughs> that um really I think so like when you talk about my process and got like you know when I read this script um I stalked Ellen as much as she stalked me and you know there was numerous zoom calls like the script was so fun we were so excited to do it we did the pilot in the height of the pandemic pre-vaccine I did the fittings in CRC in a garage with the door open with a curtain. <laughs> we're like, we're gonna do the show. Oh. It doesn't <laughs> like we're gonna be safe, but it, we're gonna do the show. So, like, you know, but the the process, the like the idea of being able to tell these stories through period costumes as opposed to contemporary to, you know, address your question, is like we have the benefit of hindsight when we're dealing with period costumes, where we can really distill like. Sure, here's the JC Petty catalog from 1971. But like, what do we really remember this? The high socks with the stripe, the high-waisted pants, the tight t-shirts. Like, sure, there's some ruffles, sure, there's big shoulders, but like what do we as you know, having the benefit of looking at it from 50 years later, we distill that made the impact. And so yeah, that's absolutely. really that's really fun as a researcher and a creative person and like a human in general. Uh to be able to go back and study. And then on top of that, bring that into the characters of the time. And like, yes, Tina's experience as a black woman coming into this space is very different than Ophelia's as an entitled white woman. Like Tina is one of the only people at Bottom Dollar that dresses in more of a professional look. And when we see her at home, she's at ease. She's the first time she's in pants. So like, that would be the truth for uh, most people of color of that time right. where all the other white girls are in jeans and t-shirts and like so you know it's those little nuances that we try to do to mm. talk about how um people of all different backgrounds came together in this like beautiful weird space yeah and, you know and this is such a not that anyone in this audience uh doubts that costuming is important but it's such a compelling argument for how costuming is such a critical part of storytelling right like the costumes are telling a story um just like every other part of production is so essential to bringing the whole thing together um Rachel I would be remiss if I didn't ask you about penises <laughs> so I'm gonna do that about penises yeah I mean it's such a so okay um but I, I do have a serious question around it. Um, the So for folks who haven't seen the first episode, there is just this like extended montage of penises. Um, I'm, I'm actually really longer. curious. I think it could have been longer. Yeah, <laughs> there was sure. We had a longer cut and then it was, it was too long for some people. <laughs> um, I am so curious about how that's casted, but we don't have to talk about that today. Um, but I, I was thinking about how like, there has been a um, increase in conversation around on set safety, especially around intimacy, around nudity, around um, uh, making sure folks feel safe and comfortable. And like, that seems like a vulnerable thing, right? Both for the people who are naked and also for everyone else. And I'm just wondering like, what, like how did you think about approaching uh, shooting that and what set life was like and how you made sure that people felt safe and comfortable? Yeah, well, it started with an intimacy coordinator, which I think people are sort of familiar with now, but it's just, it's someone like a, like a stunt coordinator, someone who comes in and sort of makes sure that everyone feels emotionally and physically safe with any nudity or any sexual situations. And so we had an intimacy coordinator who was sort of who I spoke to extensively and who was a resource for, for all the men that day. But, you know, the, the nice thing about this set and this team is that it, it really is a pretty warm and comfortable set. And so the the hope was just to bring that energy to to those guys on that day. So, you know, so starting with their fittings with Beth and, you know, and all the way through, you know, trying to make it um, not have, make it sure everyone's comfortable, but not make it have a heaviness or like a, this is a serious sex scene we're doing. It was really like, this is supposed to be fun. This is, you know, as, as written in the script, it has sort of a, a joyous element to it. And so, um, all the guys came to set that day, you know, fully clothed and, and the intimacy coordinator and I had a chat with them and we're just like, Hey, this is, you know, cause all they knew was they were going to be nude, but they didn't have that much context. So we explained, you know, this is a, this is a penis montage. Um, if you can picture like an, uh, like a audition montage for like a talent show, it's supposed to be that sort of feel. So, 
if anyone has like any weird tricks, we would love to see them. If you have anything silly you want to do, we'd love to see it. Um, and if there's anything you're not comfortable with, let us know. And, you know, and some people had concerns and boundaries and expressed those and that was fine. And then some people were like excited to do whatever weird thing and just got, got a uh, creative in there. Um, and so, you know, so it was, I, I think it was a combination of making sure that we had the safeguard of the intimacy coordinator and then just not, um, you know, like, I, I feel like in general with, with, um, with sex scenes and maybe also, or, or any, any nudity or sexuality, I'm sure that the actors can talk to this as, as well. But um, I think it's, it's like a combination of making sure everyone's boundaries are respected, but not putting that heaviness into it. That sometimes I feel like, like, I, like I've had experiences where actors are feeling less comfortable because it feels like you're sort of saying, we're doing the nudity now, guys. <laughs> everyone. And it like sort of makes it feel like a bigger deal. And so I think it's like, again, with boundaries and with the like sort of, but but making sure that it doesn't have to be like, everyone should be terrified of this because it's bad. We're doing something bad, but we're gonna do it. Yeah. Yeah, okay. yeah that's a really good point of how you can uh, over, like you can, you can do the opposite of what you're trying to do by being too aggressive <laughs> about, like you can set boundaries in a way that also makes everyone feel comfortable and e at ease, right? As opposed to like really, yeah. You said, I don't know why I'm repeating what you said. That was great. <laughs> Uh, it was just so the, fun. Like I, it's the the script, like the way it described the the dick montage. I would just also felt so light and so fun. I remember reading it and be like, "This show is going to be so much fun." And I like, and my my supervisor at the time that did the pilot is a um you know a gay man in his sixties. I was like, "You have to read this script. It is the most fun I've ever read." And like, I, but the lightness I think that Rachel was able to continue on the set really did start with the script. It, yeah. it really did. Like I remember reading that in the pilot, and that you suddenly see, uh, and now we have a dick montage, and it was written like something like that. And I was like, of course we do. I mean, of course we do. It's completely fitting. And you didn't kind of, it didn't kind of, you know, you can imagine those words written on a page. You're probably thinking, oh god, what what am I reading? What has this suddenly descended into? But it wasn't at all. It was like light, and it was kind of celebrating the human body, and there's nothing bad about nudity, it's not like shameful or bad, it's natural, and it felt like that, it was just like, here's a penis, and here's lots of penises, and look how great and different they all are, yay, it, was, it felt like that, and then on set, yeah. it also felt like that, we were all incredibly professional, and you know, but we weren't, you know, it wasn't like we were kind of attending a funeral, there wasn't kind of this sombre kind of a, a feeling to the set, it was professional, but still fun. Yeah, for sure. I actually was shocked how much attention the dick montage got because yeah. I, I mean, I, yes, you know, it was this shocking thing, but because of what Ophelia is saying, like it felt like the most natural thing ever. And it felt like it made so much sense for this show in particular, you know, when you're talking about um, feeding a dog medicine with peanut butter, you know, it was like, oh, what a smart way to do that, you know, about a show that's seventies porn. It's a male magazine, like, yes. Let's just get a deluge of dicks and then we're in. You know yeah. I mean? And and I I think part like a big reason why it was so um still in this year of 2022 shocking to people is that um you know, we have such an inequitable division of how we see bodies on, in media, right? Versus um different different types of bodies are more or less sexualized, more or less seen, more or less objectified and so um, you know, it was, it was interesting to have something that was like caring and fun and also, you know, like that wasn't exploitative really. Um, it, I think really meant a lot to a lot of folks. Well, and even, all right. Oh, oh, please just keep talking about dicks all day. <laughs> I, feel, I feel like, I mean, even maybe Alan, but I feel like I even had my own like sort of Joyce moments of being like, you know, oh, we're going to see like a lot of penises and here we go. And then, you know, and it was one of those things where like, like, if you think about it, many women haven't seen a lot of soft penises. Like I just, I really had like, even, you know, partners yeah. I have are don't like generally not like staring at a soft penis um, <laughs> in, in my life. And so it actually was like sort of interesting. And like, there's, you know, the line in the pile of like the, you know, feel like the power to just look what it was like that, that felt like you know, real on the set being like, mm -hmm. oh, wow. And now, now this show is showing us all these penises. Here we go. And like, and we're seeing that also behind the scenes. And it, yeah, it was, it, it felt, it felt like interesting. 
Yeah, it was it's also like a point in photographers. Yeah, but it also like as we try to always be body, po body positive in our work, it's like another way to be body positive. And I think when we talk about body positivity, we often think about that through the female gaze and not mm -hmm. the female gaze. And I think that this was like another great opportunity yeah. to say like, yes, like we're all beautiful in many different ways. Look at us, we're all quite different. Yeah, yeah. totally. And I think when we tried a hundred songs over that scene. I mean, Ellen and Rachel, and I, there was <laughs> there, we tried so many songs over that and it was so much fun to experiment with that. And, and you know, different songs were bringing different elements and make things were funnier or things were, you know, brought like, it was, it was really thrilling to get to work on that from a music perspective. Nice, that is awesome. I think there's something really special about um, the fact that you're so many creative folks on this team are women. As we talk about increasing um, the roles of women and non-binary folks in Hollywood, right? To see how much ownership you all have, how much leadership you all have and how you all kind of come together in this space. It's just, it's it's incredible to have to talk to you about and hear about your experiences and just talk to you about your work, right? To not be like, you are women in this space and talk about what that means, but to like really appreciate y'all for your crafts and your talents, regardless of gender. So thank you so much for taking time to speak with us today. Um, y'all are amazing. And I really want to wish you the best of luck during Emmy season.